So I'd like to thank the conference organizers. Um, this presentation really comes from my doctoral research. Uh, so I spent six years looking at Baghdadi transnational networks, and this is the first time after I finished my PhD that I've been to a conference like this. Um, that also makes it a little bit daunting because there are so many people here whose work I've read and I respect, uh, but here it goes. Um, so this paper proposes some ideas about the relationship between European and Baghdadi Jewry in the period between 1918 and 1940. My main objective is to understand how disparate Jewish communities interacted with each other in the period between, um, in the interwar period through philanthropic networks. As such, this paper aims to reframe this period around debates of Jewish transnationalism opposed to Jewish nationalism and specifically Zionism by considering how the Baghdadi communal leadership interacted with different um, philanthropic organizations to promote local community initiatives and how as a result of this, and this is specifically education but other things which I'll talk about, regular Baghdadi Jews also became part of these networks. Central to my analysis is the role of Baghdadi Jews who associated their origins with Baghdad but did not necessarily reside in Iraq. Specifically, Baghdadi Jews who immigrated to the Indian subcontinent and South Asia in the mid-19th century founding Baghdadi satellite communities, as I call them. That they, however, these communities maintained close contact with Baghdad throughout their existence. I suggest that Jewish identity for Iraqi Jews globalized and secularized in the first half of the 20th century due to the importance of transnational Jewish solidarity movements and the establishment of Baghdadi satellite communities. As part of this globalization and secularization of Jewish identity in Iraq, I consider the importance of, global multiling of the global multilingual Jewish public sphere in which Iraqi Jews participated. In looking at global Jewish networks, I consider Baghdadi Jewish participation in multiple public spheres, specifically the aforementioned global Jewish public sphere and the local pluralist Iraqi Jewish public sphere. And I think that expression probably sounds familiar to people. Um, it's intentional because in using the term public sphere, I'm obviously referring to the idea of a space where private individuals could identify and discuss societal problems with the object of taking actions to mitigate these problems. But for Iraq, of course, the person who uses this is Orit Bashkin, right, in her work. Um, um, pluralism and culture in the Hashemite period. I'm sure many people in here have read her many books. Um, and this draws on the theory of Jürgen Habermas in relation to European bourgeoisie society, which is also important in this idea of kind of a global Jewish public sphere. What's interesting um, is that it's used in a similar manner in the work of Abigail Green and Vincent Vian, um, who apply the term to global religious networks. Um, and that's work that I'm sure some of you have read, but others might not be. Um, as familiar with. But in both cases, the public sphere refers to individuals participating in salons, associations, societies, and periodicals with the aim of improving society. Um, so the emergence of a global Jewish public sphere is tied to the emergence of religious internationalism, which I think um, Abigail Green and Vincent Vian very eloquently define as. So this is quoting them directly, sorry for the long quote a configuration that drew upon traditional communal institutions and practices while remaining distinct from them. It may be defined as a cluster of voluntary transnational organizations and representations crystallizing around international issues in which both ordinary believers and religious specialists could serve as protagonists. Spurred on by developments such as revolutions, mass migration, colonial expansion, the spread of the nation state model, or the challenges of secular ideologies, the rise of religious internationals involved a double outward projection of religious energies into modern society and into the global arena. So the birth of Jewish internationalism is generally associated with the European Jewish response to the Damascus Affair. And for those who aren't aware of the Damascus Affair, it's the 1840 blood libel in which, Jewers, in which leaders of the Jewish community in Damascus and the chief rabbi of the city were arrested and tortured on the pretext of having killed a Capuchin monk and his servant. As Jonathan Frankel demonstrates, 
This event and its coverage in the European Jewish press inspired an international Jewish mobilization as European Jews tried to pressure their governments to intercede in the plight of the Damascene Jewry. When these newspapers began reporting worldwide Jewish events, it planted the seed for modern Jewish civil society. The idea that global Jewry constituted a community linked by common interests and activities. In particular, these events were of great concern to European Jewish elites, who not only felt an obligation to help their co-religionists, but to protect the already acquired rights of Jews in their home nations. Thus, these emancipated elites laid the foundations for modern international Jewish solidarity movements through the founding of philanthropic organizations dedicated to the plight of world Jewry, both to aid their co-religionists, but also, and this is very important, to reaffirm the political position of Jews in Western European countries. So there was something in it for them beyond just charity. The experience of Iraqi Jewry is tied to the rise of Jewish internationalism in Europe through their collaboration with foreign Jewish philanthropic organizations, European-inspired secular Jewish education, which Emil spoke about, and participation in, the glo in global Jewish print media. In Baghdad, the three most important organizations were the French Alliance Israelite Universelle, which has been cited many times um, over the past two days, founded in 1860. And then also, and I'm surprised that this organization wasn't mentioned more, is the Anglo-Jewish Association, founded in 1871. And then also the American Joint Distribution Committee, the JDC, or sometimes referred to as the Joint, which is founded in 1914. What then is the legacy of, Jewish interna of the Jewish internationalism that arose in the 19th century in the age of empire? I focus on the position of Iraqi Jewry during the rise of Arab nationalism in the 20th century, and therefore analyze the legacy of Jewish internationalism for Iraqi Jewry. Jewish transnational networks refer to disparate Jewish communities exchanging and offering solidarity as national movements, as national units, within a framework of philanthropic organizations, societies, and periodicals. Within this context, Solidarity movements to aid other national Jewish groups represented a new form of Jewish exchange predicated on national identities. This is in contrast to earlier periods where Jewish networks were predominantly organized around Jewish subgroups. So Sephardi, um, Ashkenazi can actually be a bit of a problematic term, but certainly Mograbi or Baghdadi, right? Um, and Matthias Lehmann talks about this a bit in some of his work. Um, but this is opposed to kind of a 20th century idea where people begin to refer to themselves in a national context. So Iraqi or Egyptian, um, in Algeria, Jews begin to refer to themselves as French, right, and take on this idea of a French nationality. In the Iraqi context, there are important differences between Jewish internationalism in the 19th and 20th centuries. In the 19th century, Jewish solidarity networks were defined by Western European Jewry and their values. In the 20th century, although there remained a power differential, Iraqi Jews were not mere aid recipients, but active players in shaping their community, and members of the Baghdadi elite held important positions in the Alliance and the Anglo-Jewish Association, and specifically uh, the Sasuri, the, <laughs> the Kadoris and the Sassoons, as I just put the two families together, um, and also uh, the Daniels and many other wealthy families. Um, ideologically, however, there is continuity between the two periods, as transnational Jewish collaboration continued to be perceived by Iraqi Jewry and Western European Jewry as a successful strategy to improve and strengthen the position of Jews in, Israel, in Iraq as they were developing a national identity. And I mean a national identity in the sense of as Iraqi citizens. It's this ideological and strategic continuity that engendered the long-term structural interconnectivity of these nationally organized Jewish groups. And I mean, a very small example of this, as Emil cited, is that in, 19, in the 1920s, the Iraqi um, national education system was very underdeveloped, and these transnational Jewish networks provide an example of local Jews being able to bring in qualified school teachers into the country, right? So these transnational Jewish ties were beneficial to the Iraqi state and to Iraqi state development. They weren't seen as a threat, they were seen as something beneficial. And obviously trade networks were also seen as beneficial. Uh, you can look at Arose Bach, for example, the, um, 
department store and how this was also um, a link between Jewish transnational networks. As Abigail Green notes, this framing of global Jewry in the 19th and early 20th century challenges the Zionist national narrative, which sees the destiny of world Jewry and its reactions to nationalism, colonialism, and anti-Semitism within the context of a Jewish state. During the vast majority of the period I, I'm considering, I argue the idea of a Jewish state was not perceived as inevitable, and Zionism was one idea amongst many in these networks. As such, an Iraqi Jew could be part of a transnational Jewish network, be interested in Zionism, even if they didn't define themselves as a Zionist, they could be curious about it, right, and not have a defined um, position, and also be part of Iraqi patriotism um, and we see this in the documents, right? People are not just a communist, right? Or just a Zionist or just a nationalist. They have different ideas which evolve over time and change. Identification with a global Jewish community was not necessarily perceived by Iraqi Jews to be in conflict with Jews as citizens of an Arab state. And thus personal or communal, communal identification with the Iraqi nation and the Jewish people was not mutually exclusive. Um, and so how do we kind of see these ideas of how does this agency, and now I'll be a bit more informal, um, how does it play out? And um, how can we study it? And what do I mean by it more specifically? So I think one important thing to think about is that there are multiple organizations. And though everyone talks about the Alliance because they're known for their schools, certainly by the 1920s, the Anglo-Jewish Association plays a much more important role in Iraq. And so when the Iraqi Jewish community has issues or they want to ha they have questions about even sometimes Iraq Iraqi um, political debates, they go via the Anglo-Jewish Association, who then refers to their contacts within the British government. And they distance themselves as well through the alliance. This is not just the alliance distancing themselves from Iraq. This is the situation of the mandate, whereby Iraqi Jews are saying, actually, Anglo-Jewry represents our objectives much more. And that plays into curriculum, right? It's no longer appropriate in the um, position of the British mandate for French to be a dominant language. So if you look at Shamash, Shamash, at the time of putting together the endowment for the school, he's actually living in Nice, France. So you would think that he would want a French school, but he doesn't. He writes to the Anglo-Jewish Association, um, and all of these documents are in their archives, and he says, I'd like a school which is heavily grounded within, um, this organ with, within the British system. Um, and you can see this by the role of the different um, of Baghdadis in these schools. Uh, slightly earlier, um, the Shahmon family donates the building for the girls' dormitories for the Alliance in Paris. So these are important donors. And of course, with money comes power and decision making. And certainly the Baghdadis who are now on the Indian subcontinent and in Far East Asia have very specific ideas of what they see as being Jewish modernity in Iraq. Whether it's misguided or not, that's perhaps a discussion for another day. But they're very much wedded in this idea of foreign language education and English in particular. And they push this and they push this within the community but they also push this within their relationships with the international philanthropic organizations. Um, and then one other interesting thing when we talk about agency is that now that Baghdadi Jews are no longer recipients of aid, but they're also developing it, and this is also their aid to Jews in Iran, for example, and also in Syria, because the main nexus for the Alliance network, although the Alliance is less important, in Baghdad in this period is still in Baghdad because of the agent of the Qadori family who manages a great deal of the funds, um, that it's a center and it's making decisions for schools even outside of Baghdad itself in this period. Um, and then finally, solidarity with German Jewry. Now, I don't know if Victor Sassoon saved 22,000 Jews or not, but there is, uh, I have my doubts, um, but there is an important Baghdadi community in Shanghai, and they are very much influenced by the influx of war refugees, and they are responsible for putting together a great deal of the infrastructure in Shanghai. Now, what's interesting about this is, of course, they're still remitting a tremendous amount of money back to Iraq in this period, 
And that money stops during the war. And it doesn't just stop because of issues with transferring money internationally. It's because they make a decision and they say, we cannot support education at the same level we've been supporting it at. We need to help these refugees. And they encourage Jews in Iraq to also reach out to German Jewry. And you have Jews in Iraq, regardless of this, who are also interested. And Jews in Iraq try to help German Jews um, in 33, 34, and later Austrian Jews come to Iraq to be doctors. They're largely unsuccessful. They also work with their counterparts in India to do the same. So although they're not successful in saving hundreds and thousands of thousands of Jews, and it was very difficult to get Jews out of Eastern Europe in this period as well, they certainly react to this. Um, it's certainly something that's very upsetting for them. And so they respond to it. And I think this shows that there's this consciousness growing of some type of global Jewish identity, which is not fully formed and certainly very fluid, but I think it's very much there and emerging um, around solidarity. And then the other point I think is important is this emergence of a global Jewish public sphere and reading trends. Um, so in Iraq, you have some newspapers, uh, some Jewish newspapers in Arabic, but certainly by the 1930s, because of censorship, many Iraqi Jews are subscribing to and reading newspapers either in English from the Jewish communities in India and in Shanghai and also reading Arabic Jewish periodicals from Lebanon and from Egypt. And in all of these periodicals, they're getting the syndicated articles of the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. Uh, so we see in this that they're reading the same stock syndicated articles as Jews in New York, as Jews in Eastern Europe in this period. And what's really funny is that there's a very Orientalist article about the Jewish community of Baghdad, which gets syndicated sometime in the 1930s. Some Jew passing through to Palestine stops and writes an article, and it gets printed in one of the Indian newspapers. And after it gets printed, there's a wave of letters to the editor saying, how could you print this syndicated piece? You know it's complete rubbish, right? Um, so we know that Jews in Baghdad are reading these articles. We also know, that reading these newspapers, we also know because they get censored in the 1930s, well, beginning in the 1930s. And there are complaints, and people write to um, the editors of other Jewish press talking about what's going on, and the Anglo-Jewish Association is asked to intercede to try to get the censorship lifted. So we know that they're reading similar newspapers, and they're writing to them as well. Uh, the Jewish Chronicle has, um, a section called Young Judea. I think it's called Young Judea. Um, and you have children from Iraq writing to it in English and joining it, and it talks about modern Jewish values. And so that's another point kind of in this, is that although you don't have a reformed Jewish movement in Iraq, you certainly have Iraqi Jews who are engaging with questions of religious reform, also in the satellite communities. Uh, there's a discussion going about when you read the Haggadah, the during the Passover Seder, the tradition was to read it in Arabic and in Hebrew, but for Jews in the satellite communities where the younger generations no longer read Arabic, would it be better to change it into English or should we do all three languages? And so these discussions um, are being moderated through these newspapers. So there is this idea of a global Jewish um, identity. And you see that Iraqi Jews are reading articles from Jews from North America and from Europe, which are discussing other questions about iterations of modernity and what religious modernity means or what it means to be a modern Jew. Um, so in conclusion, I think the elites in Asia, uh, but overall act as a bridge between Europe and Baghdad um, and get the two groups to kind of have additional interest um, on each other. Um, you see a change in the relationship between Iraqi Jewry and European Jewry in that the playing field uh, becomes slightly more even. Um, and you also see kind of this idea of national divisions, whereas prior to this period, people thought of themselves more in terms of their um, traditional religious affiliation. So what their, what their minhagim were now, it's much more a question of nationalism. Um, and then finally, kind of as an epilogue, I think it's the creation of the State of Israel and the trauma of um, the exodus from Iraq and the experience in the Ma'abaro changes how many Iraqi Jews think about their relationships with European Jews prior to this period. But I think if we want to understand how these relationships work, it's important to actually look at the documents from this period, um, the interwar period. Thank you very much.